Hi there. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this event at Beyond Baroque. I'm so happy to read for Beyond Baroque. The first time I read there was in the early 90s when my friend Akila Oliver was artist in residence there and invited me. So I'm going to read a poem for Akila that is from this book, The Loving Detail of the Living and the Dead, which came out a few years ago. And you'll hear in the poem probably that I was reading the Iliad and thinking of the Odyssey, and of course, thinking also of Aquila. The humans attract all the light of destiny to themselves for Aquila. That the father sleeps in the house of his son's killer. That the father kisses his son's killer's man-killing hands. That the gods who agree to kill the man preserve the man's body. That we know the killer will die, but he does not die in the poem. That I know I will die, but I do not die in the poem. That it is the man killed who tells us the killer will die. That the killer will be killed by the man he has killed's brother. That we know the brother will die that these deaths do not happen in the poem, that my friend will die, and it did happen in a poem, that we know the mother will die, the daughter will die before or after the mother, the father will die, the son will die before or after the mother, the mother will die, the sister. When after death does it migrate from her body to the body. Is this the cult of death, living? The killer wishes to eat the man he kills raw. The man he kills mother wishes to eat the killer raw, to sink her teeth in his liver, to have a heart erupting with slaughter, to be placed on a bier with slaughtered beasts after you have been slaughtered that you go on a manhunt to kill a man, that you kill a man or a woman or a child in a cave, in a compound, in a cafe, in a forest, on the plains, that the ghosts do not preserve the body, that you cannot wrap your arms around the ghost. And I'm going to read one other poem, very different uh, mood. And this is from a current work in progress called Your Kingdom. And in that work, I'm thinking about, to a large degree, thinking about the kinds of innovations that other animals created and that we benefit from anatomically. And then, of course, some innovations that we lost. And it, this poem is called More or Less November. First it was five, when it used to be six, and we had more light in the morning. Then it was four, when it used to be five, and it was darkening and damp. It was two, when it used to be three, and twelve, when it used to be one, and we wondered where such a ghostly packet could go skidding or slipping through holes in air? Who had whittled their canines down or dropped the long slinking vertebrae for branches? Who no longer boned at the hip? Gravity made time go, but the farther we pulled from ground where minutes should have more drag, our tails dropped and we could no longer move through trees with ease, with ease. Who be more liquid, more light? Thanks. See you soon. Bye. Hi, my name is Sally Wen Mao and I will read you a poem from my collection, Oculus. Um, it's an excerpt of a poem actually uh, called The Mongolian Cow Sour Yogurt Super Voice Girl, which was also a television program um, back in China uh, that was similar to American Idol. 
Super girls drink melamine. Melamine and scandalous milk infects us, titillates us, until the red mouth bursts open into a sewage of cherry petals. Super girls, submit your audition tapes. Give us your milky songs sung in unmolested hours. All the sad karaoke bars in every spring city. Sing like sprained finches, drive us mad with yearning, and dull the thrum of the mic. Raise your shy voices, girls. Gorge on little gospels, we'll toast to you. Raise our glasses to our lips and quaff. The camera pans to your vulnerable self. The self you want to hide is a sad, pretty thing with spindles under its eyes. It has webbed fingers, out of its throat a croak. Lashes plucked from waterline, moat of tears you hide in your flask. Is this half-dead girl good to sing? What do you say, lonely girl? What are you afraid of? The audience is listening. Think on your feet now. What do you sing for? Go ahead, recite the list. My ghost, brother and sister, the veil where I was born ashamed. My mother who gave me the milk she couldn't drink. My bedridden story has yet to begin. And I will read you another poem called Wet Market that I wrote earlier this year. Wet market. From youth, I was taught that fresh meant alive until the moment you buy it. My mother used to pick up chickens at the wet market, slit the throats herself. At four, I helped her defeather the fowl, drain its blood in a vat. My parents barely ate meat until the 1980s. In re-education camps, they ate ground pork once a year. In America, we don't buy live chickens, but my mother always wanted to see the fish alive head on before we take it home. Chaff was the best sustenance, the eyes, the head, the scales. At 12, I returned for the first time to Wuhan. In the wet market, I touch live snapping turtles, frogs in vats, smell the musk of open air stalls. You want your meat squirmy and slippery, not the squids and king conk packed in ice. The butcher slices an eel in half. I squint in disbelief at the dying I witness, live kill, slit eel, slit eyes. I've been called back home, my sight line a bloodless gash. Wet markets flourish with produce, feeding a generation, mine the offspring of those who starved, like my father, in their mother's wombs. Now pundits call for their ban, citing barbarian diets, raccoons, offal, civic cats, bush meat, not spinach and wood ear, plums and star apples. At the Berkeley Farmer's Market, no one bats an eye. How lovely it must be to possess a body cleaved of hunger and horrors, its stench so inherently clean. Nightly, I dream of Angel Island's quarantine station, my immigrant body scrubbed raw with carbolic soap, my immigrant belongings fumigated in sulfur steam. The evening I saw death, we ate, eel braised with bitter melon, drowned it in cloudy broth. To this day, the memory, how I tasted marrow, like an elegy, frozen in bone. Thank you. I'm David St. John. And this first poem I'm going to read is called The Boathouse. All the last lessons of fatigue, every passage naming its reprieve, also the few commitments of the heart. 
I thought I'd pass as smoothly as a hand passes over a globe of light hanging in some roadside bar or over the earth on its pedestal of oak in a library. I believed I'd take what came. A life with no diaries, hieroglyphics, only the crooked arc of the sun. Now, even the way I sleep speaks habit. My body slipping into the heat, the crumpled beds, every voice I hear within my own of the father, the mother, remains a saying so lost to its history. Look how I treated the day, waking listlessly beyond the pale of those horizons scored along another subtle back. And so trust seeps only into the most concrete and simple acts the fox coat, the slap, the gin smashed against the window. Maybe Homer had it right. A man sails the long way home. Now, every new morning after lights those medleyed veins of white wisteria strung above the door. No alibis survive. Half of the boathouse has collapsed, the shingled roof sloughing off its tiles as even the sea sings one octave in the past. A hard and noble patience. There is a hard and noble patience I admire in my friends who are dead, though I admit there are none of them I would change places with. For one thing, look how poorly they dress. And only one is still beautiful. And that is because she chose to drown herself in a Swiss lake, fed by a glacier set in local myth to be a pool of the gods. And when her body was found, she was so preserved by the icy currents that even her eyelashes seemed to quiver beneath my breath though that was only for an instant before she was strapped to a canvas stretcher and loaded into a blue van. Soon I was the only person still standing at the lake's edge, a man made lonely by such beauty, a man with less than perfect faith in any God. And this last poem I'll read is called Desire. There is a small wrought iron balcony and at that balcony. She stood a moment watching a summer fog swirl off the river in huge drifting pockets as the street lights grew alternately muted, then wild, then to a blurred relay of yellow. Her hair was so blonde that from a distance it shone white as spun silk. And as he turned the corner, he stopped, suddenly looking up at the window of the hotel room. 
where she stood in her Japanese kimono printed with red dragonflies and a simple bridge. And in that lapse of breath, as the fog both offered and erased her in the night, he could remember every pulse of her tongue, every paired detail of constancy left only to them. As he began walking slowly toward the door of the hotel, carrying the hard loaf of day-old bread and plums wrapped in newspaper, already remembering this past he would desire. Thank you. This is Sandra Meek, reading two poems from Still. This first poem is set in the Galapagos Islands at uh, Isabella, an island where feral goats had nearly destroyed the ecosystem and the survival of the island's giant tortoises was in question. In 2004 to 2006, environmentalists carried out a massive campaign to kill the island's 100,000 goats, shooting them from helicopters. In order to kill the last ones, to draw them out as goats or social animals, they sterilized females, now called Judas goats, killing the fetuses if they were pregnant, injecting them with hormones to attract males, fitting them with radio collars, and then releasing them. The remaining feral males would come out from their hiding places to join a Judas goat, followed by the females and the young, allowing them to be located through radio telemetry, then shot from the helicopter. The Judas goat alone would be spared and moved to the next location. Finally, there were only Judas goats left. Still with Judas goats. Project Isabella Galapagos. Selection began the terror. How I loved my new necklace, his glittering noosed ear always upon me. When he came first from the sky, when he slipped the hood over my horns, stood me onto my shoulders, I felt a sting, a clip, a brightness distancing my body. As what had quickened in me stilled in his hands, I knew he couldn't bear to share me. Shot with the needle dripping unending desire of others for me, didn't I dutifully draw my kind from their caves, making again our little society? Forgive me. Those days I almost forgot him. When the five-bladed sky powered its seraphimed shadow upon us, how we ran, I with them. The ones who'd mounted me, the little ones racing still for their mother's teats, how they dropped to their knees, their legs snapped broomsticks, leaves still spun from the glossy corners of their mouths, their fur glistening with rain-sleek roses, lipsticked kisses blown from their bodies. But wasn't I, the beloved, the one left, taken again under his wing until it all again began? How many times this occurred is beyond my measure. Finally, I could gather only those like me, the startled girls, each of us taken in to believe we were the one. We knew each other by our war-slicked eyes, the echo of our suture, future-emptied bodies, how we each wore the charm of his listening around our neck. And no more did the sky empty upon us. No more did he come for us. The grass grew lush under our few hooves, for we did not increase. And the great ones who had long withered inside their domed shells 
began again to move among us. The ones we now knew all had been done for, though we were left freely to eat what we would, what would have fed so many lost we'd led. O oh God, in the whirling machine, didn't we well bring your weather down? Now we bow our heads only to the recovering green. This next one is set in Iceland. Still life with Zodiac Boat and Glacier Lagoon. A bowl of white light, spiked meringue peaks, debris veined, black ash and gravel till, blue milk fins calving into melt. Too much to stay against one's own weight borne by speed, by wind, not weather, but the fast forward of a century on fire, bold forth by my own eyes burning toward sheared sapphire, by the pull cords raveling wick with which I lit this engine, this small blind body of need. Hey y'all, my name is Juby Ariola Headley, and I'm pleased to be here with you today to share a couple of poems. The first poem I'm going to read you is from my debut collection of poems, Original Kink. Isn't this cover gorgeous? I only hope the poems inside live up to it. Anyway, the second poem is a poem that I've written during the pandemic. In matter of fact, I wrote it in the past week. So let's get started. The first poem, like I said, I'm going to read you is from Original Kink. In fact, it's the first poem in the collection, and it's called Peacocking. You a boy, right? It's this silly game I play with myself, scavenging for scraps of conversation out of context, like peacocks in the Arctic, or tenderness expressed in baritone. And here, in this department store, like every other, I'd found it, a single word, sharp and swift to Fisher, boy. Perhaps the boy had stared too long at the man behind the cosmetics counter, gothic arches where eyebrows once grew. Perhaps the boy had lingered, longing, lusting, fingered the fabric of some skirt or blouse as the man I can't imagine is his father dragged him through the missus section. This boy, broken his stride, his spirit, while some woman I can only imagine the boy calls mother guided her gaze toward anywhere but this moment. She's long seated hope for something soft in the boy. I wish I didn't know the rest of his story, how butterflies won't so much settle in a boy's belly as slit their own throats for fear of flamboyance. How a boy must fashion his fists into ciphers for touch. How quick we are to teach a boy to cradle his hurt in his hands and preen. So like I said, that's the first poem in the collection, Original Kink. And in case you forgot what it looks like, this is it, out now from Sibling Rivalry Press. And the second poem I'm gonna read, I don't know what to say about it, except I think it's reflective of so much that's going on in our nation and our world right now. And I'll just read it to you. It's called Still Life. Over morning coffee, I gossip with God. It's a green belly blend, I'm sure of it. 
whispers of Maya and Maïs throughout. God, being God, does most of the talking. Between slurps, God lists all the ways in which humans have broken our covenant. Chief among our sins, God says, are flowers, cut flowers, in a still life, in a vase, in a funeral arrangement. What must it feel like, God asks, to gut a living thing, to knock a thing sideways when it should have been monument? How you'll hobble a moment when all it wants is to bloom, then pose its scuttled husk as an act of devotion. An abomination, says God. Except when God says bloom, they pronounce it Brianna. And somehow I know knock comes out sounding exactly like warrant. And gut is less a word spoken, more a crucifixion, an act, a crime unspeakable in every language but ours. But how is this different from what you did to Jesus, I ask? So certain of I, of our collective lack of blame, so certain we are bound for hell regardless, I think I'll take this bullet for humanity. So. Who is the you and the we in this fiction, God asks, resting their chin in their hands, drinking me in the way one sits with any queerness. God will slip into vernacular at will. And have I so failed you that you cannot think of me without thinking of spilt blood? Yes, I think, but don't say. I've been bred far too blue to ever talk smack. Yes. So those are my two poems for today. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. I hope you'll buy original kink and pardon me for showing you this gorgeous cover one more time. And I'm just trying to make it through like the rest of y'all in this crazy shit show of a moment. So all I can say to you is what I'm trying to live by right now, which is stay safe, find joy wherever you can, resist. Hi everyone, I'm Travis Denton. First off, I wanna thank Elena Byrne and everyone at the LA Times Book Festival, and of course, Emmett Conklin, and all the folks at Beyond Baroque for, uh, for pulling this together. Thank you very much. I'm going to be reading from my latest book, my, my stunt double, The Body. The orange pines for your tongue, starves without you. The dance wants your arms and legs wrapped around it your face nuzzled in its neck. The coat is empty. Shirts locked themselves away in darkness, given themselves to the hanger, which has given itself to the rack. The moths which ate your sweaters have chewed holes in their wings. Your footprints chase after you and have found only your shoes by a river. And when you speak, if you do, our ears are empty sails. What the satellite saw. Floating on a wave of anti-gravity, it beams a cloud 600 miles across with an eye staring back into space. Unearthly cyclops. The ocean has crawled back from the beach, boats ebb on a sandy pudding, and the rain falls sideways. Amid boil warnings, we stew our nouns and verbs into simple sentences by candlelight. If this is the apocalypse and the zombies toddle out near dusk, we'll be there like empty grocery store shelves, canned goods burrowed out the sliding doors. 
our hearts like batteries. We brush our teeth in bottled water as the water on the street rises and the storm surge in all of us, and all of its holy ghostiness pronounces us alive as we Google what to make with the hell the storm left. Ice cream? Or if it's enough, we'll pack our wounds with it. Praise the dark, the street lights out, the moon out, no planes overhead, no sirens, dog walkers kenneled for the day, whole cities sparking as lines go down. And you roll over, touch my face, and remind me, happy apocalypse, baby, happy apocalypse, this is all we get. I'm going to finish up with a poem called In the Days When There Were the Many Gods, and and most of this is entirely true. There was a barn owl with an arrow through one eye that lived in my backyard. At any second, it was staring down the shaft of the weapon with its one good eye, the feathered end of the bolt sticking from the back of its head. At that moment in my life between grad school and watching another woman pack her car and with the thrill of a quiet house and its empty bed, I stood ready to praise once again the sirens on the street and windows vibrating near dawn with the first bus headed downtown. I was still amazed at the many gods there were in the world then their watchful eyes waiting to feed some hunger to punish or promote. I'd sit on the back patio with red wine, my favorite of the Punisher gods, and the tenacious sense of consequence that said everything I did meant something. And I'd watch the bird, I thought of the possum that lived under the shed and pictured it lumbering out past dark and pitting his spikes of teeth against the owl's tines. And having exhausted all the others, I'd pray to that raptor, God of the blood moon and new moon, God of the survivor, God of the last one standing, God of the slow to wrath, God of the oak tree in my backyard, God of the North American marsupial. Some days I'd sit there, the owl ten feet above me in his oaky perch, and watch it watch my terrier chase tennis balls the owl's head like a surveillance camera, tracking its every move or staring into the middle distance of Atlanta's skyline, the arrow in the owl's eye like a compass pointing north, northwest, due south. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm joining you from Balboa Park in San Diego, and I'm going to read from my new book, The Voice of Sheila Chandra, which is um, three long poems. Um, So I'm just going to read little pieces of it. From The Voice of Sheila Chandra. What represses unhomes in the sound who has made me? What is made me? Is a voice just muscles and shape and breath? to phrase a song, boats assemble at the mouth of the harbor, mouth in earth, you who wrote an ode to silence, never wrote of what is silence. I did seek all resounding caves, let the voice be lit, all the lanterns in the new world we need, the language of stone from string to string, quiver in the opening, the garden so beautiful, Lucifer, dark sun of morning, no Eden, but innocence, no expulsion, but after. No more will I listen to other than a single note moaned, not known. I do not hear, think again, what place presents itself, own, moan, well, I hear body as a battery of the one moment when it is time to open your mouth to plug in. I will allow what I invented to find its color, make a shape which 
neither water nor sky do. How do you now in this contained shape go through your life, not like a constellation, not guessed at, intuited, or divined, no name, so how do you discern a shape for what is often called God? Vanta Black was made for missiles or defense purposes so dark, no eye could see it. Some voices are like that, no one could hear them. It is not good to be lost. To be lost is more than a metaphor for spiritual condition. I sit here at the terrace overlooking the green sea. Perhaps it is a failure that ought to be sought. The voice that fails falls silent. Sheila's or the bodies, the blue failed me. The sun fails every evening. I, we, you have all failed to everyone who strove all these long years for peace failed. Can she still feel music in her body? Can she vocalize even without technology of the mouth, tongue, palate, glottis, vocal cords? What is a voice? Anish Kapoor granted exclusive right to work with blackest black. She now communicates through notes and gesture. Vanta black made for military purposes like sound also used for torture. All sounds to wake you, vibrate your brain. What emerges as an echo from music as torture. Children on the beach playing God is sound or art or science. Shit and sex, the body's echo. What a mess is left in the big or the little death. The night we swam, the full moon civilized us, federated us, gave us our nationality. We who were lost, I have now lost. What little heritage I did have returned to the rude, rough world. Long vowels of morning, evening, birds scream. No soft blanket falling to cover, but a throttling, a suffocation of dusk. No silence when the self stills. The absence of noise is itself torture. I cannot sleep tongued loose drones move through a riff by a singer without papers. I think I will read you one more little poem. Thanks for listening for a little while. Uh, when I was in France, it was also during the same time as, uh, oh, there's a plane, <laughs> uh, wildfires in the south. So that is described here at the beginning of this piece. We woke to the smell of burning air, a little cool smell of charred refuse, colors muted. Last night, the moon came clear, nearly blue eyes too, painfully large, rough, on the eyes and impatient, but I wanted to look so badly for the meteors, the sea crashing against the rocks, smoke from the fire obscured the sky. In the morning, we rode across the harbor and realized fear of heights and fear of depth is the same. Just one you see and one you don't. Thank you so much for listening. Hi, I'm Chad Sweeney. I'll be reading from my newest book, Little Million Doors, an elegy for my father who suddenly passed away. And this is from Nightboat Books, Little Million Doors. My skin felt heavy. I left it draped over a chair to walk out, 
across the wet colors of May. I could see time glow. I could see the ancestors of trees. Let me ask you this. What name was I? Each house in a street of houses, my hands in the trees for bells. I promise to what purpose was my story, the ripple of snake skins or sounds long in the curtains. Long days of rain, a phone was ringing. High over the steps, the wet gables of the world, immortal it was, our souls streaming into quiets of wood grain toward what plane of convergence. For years I could not answer a music in pain, the undying will, undying in the dying of the grass. And the road was all of bones, and all and only I was on it, walking to where at noon forever a voice, far and thinly, was it my voice, filling up the canyons, the boxes of its meanings? I say was, what I mean is, will be. I tried to peel away the names. I said, who is God? And watched the sound ripple into green. I tried to pray, said, take me to the center. And spread thin, I was everywhere. If cities are nothing, a single bucket of night is enough. My clothes grew tired, an end of day. I begged this air to hundred me as many genders as bees in the lavender field, my lovely hero. What nothing like sleep did the water. Where have you gone, little murder? Find me here. Did I grow a shadow in this? Did I belong to table and to roses? A woman leads the skeleton of a dog. Her mouth floats by, praying beneath her eyes, where time gusts against the slow hills. And where am I in this? The hills are listening. See me, I almost shout, or I do shout. I must be like green day stars, a few washed out in the low heaven. I am the heaven that touches to shoelaces, to the steps, the white lamps still lit at noon. I entered the museum to color square spaces of paint with my absence. I was murdered. I was stillborn, I died old, I tried on these robes in light repose over patterns of water, surrounded then traced, all futures brimmed under grapevines, the wind a flower, I relived my death or someone's, here language opens at the wound. I would carry my body all the way back, I would carry the eyes of it, I would carry the hands of it. I would wash the skin. I would bear the feet. I would draw the blood out long and shine it. And there are too many moons. Each of us through prisms echo the brightly against columns, the columns, a bodiless animal eating the air above tracks where no train is, little million doors and darkly from here the future looks like many attempts to ask. Or someone's shadow working like a hammer, working high above the water wheel, the shadow of a thought, delicate. The boy swaddles a babe across the minefield, innocent. The gravity in ropes singing down the whole earth like a mirror for something. Death, I think, if there is such a place in beauty, Landscape without the landscape in it, and nothing outside me. Thin, colorless sky among the olive branches, and in the long windows of children's mouths, my life without me in it, at the center of no center, is a flower. And I was quickling through archways, and over grain floors and water, the arches were only my body, the wet steps of libraries, room after room, the fountains, a page of air I was, looking for an end in the book of everything. In shafts, in mines, 
in salt marshes, a turtle's wet roof, in reeds and mud, and watching thistle release its down, where hold and release were one word. In the small I was, futuring the thistle to twelve distances of God. What is this between us? A world? And I was futuring the thistle to twelve distances of God. What is this between us? A world? Hi, my name is Deborah Paredes, and I am the author of the poetry collection Year of the Dog, which was published in April 2020 by Boa Editions. The title of my book, Year of the Dog, refers to two different things. The first is the year of the metal dog, the year 1970, which was the year I was born and the year my father um, was preparing to be deployed to Vietnam after being drafted, along with so many poor and immigrant and black and brown um, young men. And um, it also refers to the figure of Hecuba from Greek mythology, who was the queen of Troy and who after the war was held captive as all the women were taken um, by the Greeks. And on her way back on the ship that she was heading back uh, with the Greeks um, as one of their slaves, she cried out and cried out over all that she had lost and all the horrors of war. And she howled and howled until she was eventually transformed into a dog. And she leapt from the ship freed from captivity and spent the rest of her days howling like a dog uh, uh, on an island in the middle of the sea. So in many ways, the book hopes to both document a particular moment in history, the Vietnam era, but also to become a part of and to take part in uh, the long tradition of women and othered women and women of color um, who have cried out against injustice. The first poem I'll read is called Self-Portrait with Weeping Women. I know why I fell hard for Hecuba. Shins skinned and lips split to blooming lupin on her throat's rough coat, hurled down the whole length of disaster. I'm sure I'd grown to know by then to slacken as a sail against the current and squall of a woman's woe. What could I do? but chorus my ruddered howl to hers. When you're a brown girl raised up near the river, there's always a woman bereft and bankrupt, bloodied and bleeding her insistent lament. Ay, Yorona, every crossing is a tomb and a tune, a wolf wail and the moon that turns me to scratch at the tracks of every Mud dirged girl. A number of the poems in the book um, draw from idioms, which I think in some ways becomes our most mundane and cliched form of language. And I wanted to take that most everyday kind of language and hopefully remind us of the violence we find even there and that we maybe have become uh, inured to hearing. Uh, and so this poem is a uh, poem from one of those idioms um, and includes the idiom um, as many of them do from body parts. So this is called a show of hands. My father taught me never to show my hand. Always play the hand you're dealt. Don't bite the hand that feeds. You gotta hand it to him. He lived his life hand to mouth. Even before Nam, he knew close only counts in horseshoes and Hand grenades go hand to hand combat. Idle hands are the devil's play into the enemy's hand it over and out of his hands. Ringing a bird in hand is worth two. In the bush, he wasn't so good with his hands. Took his life into his own blood on his hands, on the one hand and on the other. And then I will um, close with a poem um, in honor of um, the ongoing disaster that we find ourselves in. Self-portrait in the time of disaster. All morning, my daughter pleading outside, outside, 
By noon, I kneel to button her coat, tie the scarf to keep her hood in place. This is her first snow, so she strains against the ritual, spooked silent, then whining, restless under each buffeting layer, uncertain how to settle into this leashing. I manage at last to tunnel her hands into mittens, and she barks and won't stop barking. Her hands suddenly pause. She's reduced to another state, barking all day in these restraints. For days after, she howls into her hands. The only way she knows now to tell me how she wants out. Thank you so much. And thank you for reading this book and for listening. And I am sending you all my best during this moment, another moment of disaster we find ourselves in and also filled with great hope. Hi everyone, I'm Katie Ford and I'll be reading from my book called If You Have to Go, which um, I'm grateful to Grey Wolf Press for printing in 2018. Um, and uh, thank you for coming to listen to poetry. I'll be starting with uh, a sonnet. The book is mostly made of sonnets. And so I'll read uh, some of the sonnets and then I'll end on a couple of other poems. I knew better than to light, light after light. I knew, I can't recall to see candles out and could put the house down in burning. What if someone asked me then, do you want to receive its ashes? I'd say, yes, that's the right thing. But deep down I'd say, no, no ashes. To imagine the size of the box, able to hold my home and take it into my hands is something I promised my hands I'd never have them do. They argued their case atrociously well when they gave as evidence, we can't. Yet lighting candles, it's how I went on. By candlelight, the house went down. It's no wonder the rats won't come sleep in my newly rented corners. For me, a gathering of low creatures would be a luminous, a concordant uh, thing. Be slow to wish extinct the ugly beasts. You can't know when all that's theirs will be more than yours. When a haystack of sleep huddled on your porch should it come, wouldn't make all that's alive at dawn be the drop of four bottles in a handled box that, while they still shake to settle, means someone left a remnant store of himself, a vibration, a glass ghost, a someone, an else, and four sweet milks to drink. Over my home I rise on a trembling wood and rope bridge. Sundown comes in light, light red. Lamps hung now in my hair, a light one question into the air. Home, I made you best I could. Please don't break again beneath me. I beat heavily upon my life until it gave. As for prices, I've paid and paid. All the while I cut the tiniest chairs, a thimble ship, rice paper walls and Japanese fans cut from receipts no wider than a little girl's nail. Upon them I drew hills of wild plum. Then a hover of birds. It was the constancy of birds I heavy leaned upon. 
I'll risk you not believing to tell a little truth. I rely upon their whereabouts sound right now. No one coming for me. I could rot here in days. I know Simone says forge a home in the void. It's the void wherein roams the battered kingdom, though she wouldn't use that word, and neither would I, except it came to me as a strange feeling at my door to show the stones its pockets bore, to sit and tell it was once just a word for no. Some spit in the face of lords. No matter how we try, we're no good in the void. Not the kingdom, not I, so birds, constancies, stay, stay a spell in my persimmon tree. I'm hefting myself up so my vacancies might quiet in your perfect neutrality. No contingency between us, no intimacy is no promise, but that we're alive a little together. At dawn, you undo my bedroom silence, and my emptiness isn't, is not, all mine to tend. It's not traceable, but to feel its radiance maybe is all, maybe is everything, maybe then arrives the dying that breaks forth, can break open, can break your life. It will break you until you remain. Thank you very much. And everyone take good care of yourselves. My name is Reginald Dwayne Betts. I'm here to offer reading for Beyond Baroque. Epigraph for this whole ordeal is a uh, red mass. Fuck billboard. I'm a bullet on the block. Blood history. The things that abandon you get remembered different. As precise as the English language can be, with words like penultimate and perseverate, there is not an exact combination of sounds that describe only that leaving. Once, Drinking and smoking with buddies, a friend asked if I longed for a father. Had he said wanted, I would have dismissed him in a way that youngins dismiss it all. A shrug, sarcasm, a sharp jab to the stomach. Laughter, but he said longing. And in a different place, I might have wept. Said once, my father lived with us and then he didn't. And it fucked me up so bad that I didn't think about us leaving until I held my first son in my arms and only now speak on it. Once, a man who drank whiskey and wild Irish rose like water told me and some friends that there is no word for father where he comes from. Not like we know it. There, the word for father is the same as the word for listen. The blunts we passed around let us abandon our tongues. Not that much, though. But what if the old head knew something? And if you have no father, you can't hear straight. Years later, the same friend from before wonders why I didn't give my son my father's name. As if he ain't know. Some things turn your life into a prayer. The gods will certainly answer. The Lord might have given him wings. There was something wrong with him. Our poor thing. And if prisoners were black, men go to become 
Lazarus. I want to become Jonah. This brother must already have wings. They call it inevitable. Everything after that hour's confession. The silences and walls that drown the living. And what of his victims? Their skin is dark as the night. No one calls him kid. The arms he slides in a sweater for protection against the cold. Slender enough to fit in the fists of a large man. That's what I mean. His hands large enough to grip the black of the pistol to squeeze the quiver of a trigger is what the prosecutor says. The holy have left, we know. And the kid, his halo, the daffodils of poverty and the ones who abandoned him. His sentence, a cataclysm of the guns he poured and a dirt shroud of dead teenagers in cities he's never known. When they name mass incarceration, he will be amongst the number and the victim's mother, her black invisible against the subtext of her son's coffin, will be on the other side of what? Of advocacy. The kid has folded his wings into his body, and though he longs for flight now, only years remain to satisfy his want for freedom, shorn. And the corridors before him are as long as the Atlantic. Each cell a wave threatening to cough it. And no one believed he'd make such a beautiful corpse. Thank y'all for listening, man. As always, as always for the people who got a minute to hear the poems that all of it matters. And so, you know, whoever hears this, thank you for taking a minute to listen. And I hope you enjoy the other readers.